All right, guys, we're going to get started. So what we're going to do today is we are going to uh, do the training planning seminar like we do that at Unscared. Slight uh, change from what we normally do. Uh, so there is no uh, group assignment. Normally we would break up in groups and do some stuff uh, so you get more of a grasp on how to plan your week, like in practice. If after this whole session you still have questions, obviously uh, you can always hit up your own private coach and ask them to help you with, you know, week planning and, and all your training programming and such. Aside from that, if you have any questions, don't hesitate. Just uh, use the Q&A and make sure you have your questions. Uh, once every so many minutes, I will uh, give like a 30 second break. People can type in their questions. We're going to go through a few of them throughout the whole thing. Uh, what are we actually going to talk about? We're going to talk a bit about training physiology. So that's basically a few uh, basic principles behind uh, training in general. We're going to go through a few concepts behind it, and we're going to see if we can translate that to daily practice. So that means uh, regardless if you are a runner or a crossfitter or a strength athlete, the same principles will apply, even though the practical side of things may vary uh, in a lot of ways. So hopefully, which is the goal of today, you will have a better understanding of how to uh, plan your training, especially throughout the week, for more injury prevention, more performance, and hopefully a better training career in the long run. So we're going to start with, I am going to share my screen with you. What we're going to do first is, I wonder why it's not working. There we go. All right. What we're going to do is I'm going to run you through a few slides here. So awesome title, more efficiency, more gains, fewer injuries through smart training. To some extent, obviously, if you're training at Unscared, you already have a, a good programming. And uh, even if you have a different coach, I would assume that they would at least take these principles into account. The biggest challenge is when you try to combine different sports or when you train many times in one week. That's when it gets a bit hard because you obviously want to make sure that you're very efficient about it. You don't want to hurt yourself. You want to get everything you can out of training. So what we're going to do first is we're going to talk a bit about the qualities of fitness. In CrossFit, we have 10 of those. So you have strength and endurance and agility and mobility and all those things. Um, for the purpose of this seminar, we're kind of going to uh, group them together because we don't have to go through all those separately. It's more that you get an idea of breaking up training. We can look at a general workout. We can also look at the different qualities of fitness that you're trying to train with that workout. So here's the first one, cardio, refers to a number of things. First is the aerobic base that is mostly systemic. What does that mean? It basically refers to your heart and lungs, making sure there's enough oxygen throughout your body. It's systemic because it refers to the whole system, to the whole body. Um, why is this so important? Well, basically if your body can utilize oxygen very well, you can do things that last longer. So the obvious thing here is like a marathon, it takes a long time, so you need a very, very strong aerobic base. If you are a power lifter, you don't need a very strong aerobic base because all you need to do is recover between your workouts and recover between your sets and when you're doing heavy squats, and that's about it. The other part of cardio is the higher intensity cardio that we see in CrossFit, which is partially dependent on that whole aerobic base, but also highly localized. What does that mean? That means that when you are doing a lot of air squats, for example, um, your upper body doesn't really have to do a lot. Right? Your legs are going to burn. That's a localized thing. And if I'm doing, uh, let's say, lots and lots of ring rows, it's going to burn in the upper body, uh, but not in the legs. Both of them use that aerobic base, but they also have a lot of localized stuff going on. It can go about uh, using carbohydrates, sugars, to make those muscles function. Uh, it can be about something called lactate clearance. Uh, for those that don't know what it is, you could Google it. But for the purpose of the seminar, that's not super important. What is important is to know that cardio is one of these qualities of fitness that you mean, need to maintain and improve for most sports. Another one is strength. There's a lot of ways how you can actually um, kind of gauge strength. You can measure it with doing a heavy back squat. You can do it with a push-up versus a bench press. Um, there's a lot of ways of doing it, but basically it is the ability to apply force with a muscle or a group of muscles. Um, a one rep max deadlift is a great example. 
what are you doing? You're lifting a super heavy weight. You only have to do it once. Uh, that is for a lot of people, pure strength. Then we have power. And power is basically strength uh, multiplied by speed. So it's still applying force, but in a very specific time frame. So if you do a deadlift, it's mostly strength because it doesn't matter if it takes you two seconds or six seconds, uh, the weight is still going up. You're still uh, providing the work. When it comes to power, let's say a power clean, you cannot do a super slow power clean with decent weights. You need to be fast. So a power clean may last, let's say, one second. So you may be able to use less weight. There was less strength, but there was a lot more speed. Um, this is separate from strength because to be powerful, to do a power clean or a jump or a snatch or even a kettlebell swing, you need a certain amount of strength and you need to be able to apply that in a short period of time. Super important for weightlifters, sprinters, but also for the crosser, obviously. Then we have speed. Speed can refer to two things. One is skill, repeating a movement. So a simple example is thrusters. So for those who don't know what it is, a thruster is just a front squat into push press. And you often do this for many repetitions. So you, get the, you do a squat, you get the weight into the air, the weight comes back, and you need to do lots of reps in a row. Even a kettlebell swing is lots of reps in a row. Um, how fast you can do these reps in a row can refer to speed. But usually when we talk about speed, we talk about how fast can you execute a movement. It could be a jump. Uh, or a power clean, but usually when it comes to power clean, there was so much weight that we talk about power. Speed often refers more to throwing a ball, for example. Let's say you play baseball, you want to throw the ball. It is super light, you still need to be super fast. So that's more on the speed end. You can see speed and strength as both ends of a spectrum. Speed is throwing a ball. Power is a jump or a power clean. And then there is strength, which is super heavy squats and deadlifts. Mobility. This one gets a bit complicated because not everyone uses the same definition. If you ask a lot of physical therapists, they will say that flexibility uh, refers to how much a muscle can move and mobility refers to how much a joint can move. In strength training, they often use a different definition. That's the same as I use. Flexibility is passive. So let's say that I um, lie on my back and I have someone stretch my hamstring for me as far as I can. That's passive, that's flexibility. Mobility refers to having control over it, right? So that means, uh, for example, uh, doing a, a straight leg deadlift where I keep my legs almost straight and I have to lift a lot of weight by using my hamstrings. There's a lot of stretch on there, but I still have control and I'm still able to use that flexibility. So passive flexibility is great for getting into a certain position. Maybe you do that to improve mobility. Maybe you do that for fun, for yoga, whatever. But to actually be able to use that uh, is what we often refer to as mobility, which is what we want in CrossFit, for example. There is no reason to be in a super deep squat if you cannot get out of it. That's a very simple way to explain it. Last one, accuracy, coordination, agility. For now, I'm going to put all those under skill uh, because these really depend on the sport you are doing. Um, for what I want to do here is take a mini break of the slides. And I want to give you guys a very short moment to ask your questions. If there is anything that is unclear about the whole qualities of fitness thing, this is your moment to uh, put a few questions in the Q&A. I'm going to take a short moment to go into that. If there are no questions, obviously, we're just going to go on to the next step. So here's to the awkward 30 seconds of waiting. Maybe slightly less. So again, use the Q&A button for your questions or just put them in the chat box. Cecily will relay the questions to me and we'll get into that. Again, guys, don't wait with the questions. As soon as you have a question, just put them in and we'll get to them as soon as we have one of these small breaks. Dozens of attendees and no questions, awesome. Must mean that we're doing a great job of doing the presentation. All right, we're going to go into the next one. Again, if a question pops up, just put them in the Q&A. We'll get to that later. We're going further. After the qualities of fitness, we're going to talk a bit about the laws of training. So the laws of training are uh, basic principles that go for training in general. So it doesn't really matter if you're a CrossFitter, a triathlete, or a golf player. These principles, to some extent, apply for everyone, just in a different manner in practice. The first one is specificity. So specificity basically means you get better at what you do. So you want to be a great runner, run. You want to be a great weightlifter, lift weights. 
Now, the thing is, it's not just about something that looks like something else. It's also about the specificity of the adaptation. That might be a bit complex, but what it boils down to is that everything you do should transfer to the thing you're trying to get better at. So let's take running, for example. Uh, if you want to get better at running, the most specific thing you can do is run, right? That's fairly simple. Now, I want to improve my running, but I also want to do other things to improve running, you know, or maybe to get a stronger core, or I want to, um, I don't know, uh, improve my uh, strides length or my uh, ground contact time, whatever. There's a lot of factors in running. So what am I going to do? Am I going to put a barbell with 60 kilos on my back and I'm going to run five miles? Probably not. Even though it looks a lot like the sport that I'm doing, what I'm looking for an adaptation. I'm trying to get my body to get better. So what could I do? Well, if you do a heavy deadlift, you will strengthen your butt muscles. You will strengthen your abs. You will have more control over the lower back and ab muscles as you run. So a deadlift looks very different from running. Still, it can have a very positive impact on running. So keep in mind, specificity is not about doing something that looks like something else. It's about trying to get better uh, at your main thing by doing other things or by doing that main thing, right? So a hockey player can get better by doing hockey, but could also benefit from doing power cleans. A crossfitter can get very good at doing what he needs to do by doing their box jumps and wall balls and so on, but maybe uh, simply doing heavy back squats outside of the uh, typical crossfit workouts will also help. Then there's progressive overload. Progressive overload means uh, overloading your body in a way that is uh, more intense every time. So let's say that today I squat 10 kilos that will tell my body get stronger. So the next time I squat, I do 11 kilos. And the next time I squat, I do 12 kilos and so on and so forth. Running, same principle. You cannot run a 5K all the time and nothing else and expect to do ultra marathons at some point. You know, there's going to be... Uh, an increase per workout or there's going to be an increase per week or there's going to be an increase in speed or there's a lot of ways of doing it but you need to give your body some sort of bigger stimulus to get better strength training is the most obvious thing in crossfit it's a bit more complicated because crossfit is not very linear you know you, every one of you guys who has done crossfit or even something that looks remotely like it the workouts are often very different so it's a bit harder to measure progressive overload so what you do you do in sports like those? You work as hard as you can. Coach has an intended stimulus. It says, hey, guys, today you need to go as hard as you can or as fast as you can or as heavy as you can. And that will, if you're doing it right, hopefully cause progressive overload. Even in terms of skill, this goes. Because where a weightlifter, for example, can start with a stick, a stick feels very different from a barbell. So you start with a stick drill. At some point, you still have to go to a barbell, not just because it's heavier and it gets you stronger, but it helps you coordinate a heavier weight as well. So even for technique work, to some extent, this goes as well. You need to do things that tackle your weak point and more and more and more. Then there's reversibility. This one is very important for the CrossFitters, but also for other athletes who use um, sport-specific strength training. So simple example, let's say I'm a sprinter. Um, I, I have a 200-meter sprint, super important competition. Am I going to squat two days before uh, the, the sprinting competition? Probably not. Am I going to squat five days out of competition? What about seven or 10 or 12 or 20? If I do not squat for too long, my legs will get weaker because I'm not doing it. That's reversibility. Everything you gain in training, you can lose. The good thing is, even though it takes a very long time to build up fitness and strength and so on, it also takes quite a while to actually get very bad at it. The process of uh, degenerating starts pretty quickly for a lot of, of those qualities of fitness, but it usually takes a long time before you actually get super weak or super unfit, even though it might not feel like it. You see this with a lot of people who've been super fit and strong in their younger years. They're older and they still have a lot of their strength or fitness that they had uh, back in the day. So reversibility is very important when it comes to training planning because this sprinter does not want to become weaker, but he also doesn't want to be tired before his competition. What does that mean in practice? We're going to go into that later on. Then there's the SRA model, stimulus recovery adaptation. Uh, we don't have to go super in depth on this. You guys can Google it if you want to know more about the background of this. The principle is very simple. 
A stimulus is your training. You do something, you get better. Simple. Then you recover from this because you fatigue your body. Maybe you damage your muscles. Maybe you uh, deplete your energy stores. Maybe you're mentally fatigued and all that. You need to recover from all that. And then there's the adaptation. An adaptation basically means getting better at it. So building more muscle mass, improving your conditioning, uh, improving your strength. Those are all adaptations, right? Um, super short break. Uh, any questions uh, on the laws of training? Still no questions. Awesome. Short awkward break again. Again. Ooh, put... I have a question. Oh, 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 there's a question. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So, Chris asks Can you apply progressive overload to, for example, a specific goal? Let's say I want to squat n kilos. Do I start with a certain percentage? How long would the cycle of progressive overload take? That's a great question. Basically, the question is. Um, how do I progressive overload for specific goals and how long does it take? Well, to answer the last question, how long does progressive overload take? Well, as long as it takes. I know that's a very, um, not the answer people want to hear, but it really depends on the person. As a general guideline, strength and muscle mass uh, increase very, very, very small over the course of the first few uh, days. So that means that it is a consistent um, is a consistent pattern that needs to come back. As a general rule of thumb, within one week people adapt pretty quickly. Uh, within three weeks you've had most of the adaptations, and then you can build up to between six and twelve weeks. So um, regarding your specific goal, you say you want to squat uh, a bunch of kilos. Let's make this practical. Hold on, I'm going to share. Let's see, I am going to share Excel with you guys. Um, there. All right. Um, so simple example, let's say I wanna have a 12 week program for my squats. Uh, first, you need to decide what your goal is. Well, you gave the example, I want a certain back squat. Well, okay, you need progressive overload for that. So let's say that you have 12 weeks, right? So you have week one, you have week 12, and there's all these weeks in between, week nine, all that. Great. So you want to end up in week 12 with, let's say, a new one rep max. So let's say your one rep max is 100 kilos, and your goal is 110 kilos, all right? So that's what we're hitting for. One set of one repetition and 110 kilos. So what do we do? You want to start easy-ish. If we assume that you can increase 1% to 5% per week, that's a guideline I often use for strength work, 1% to 5% a week, let's say 2%, right? That means 24% because we have 12 weeks to increase. Um, so let's work from 110 kilos. That's our goal. So we take 24, let's say for the ease of calculating, 25% of 110 kilos. That's uh, 20, 27 and a half. Let me just calculate before I go too fast for some people. I have 12 weeks. I'm gonna increase 2% every single week. We're gonna, that's 24%, we're gonna round it to 25%. That means in week 12, I need to be at 100%. And in week one, I need to be at 75%, right? And maybe I'm gonna start with sets of five because it's very doable and it gets heavy, it gets heavy, sets of five, sets of four, sets of four, three, three. And at some point I end up just two and I'm going to hit my single, right? So short recap, I have 12 weeks. I want to increase 2% per week. So it's 24, 25%. And then you just increase 2% every week. You start with lots of reps and sets and it gets lower, lower, lower because the weight gets super high. And at some point, hopefully you will end up with the 110 kilos. This is one way out of many to do this. Uh, you don't have to memorize this whole method. The basic pr uh, premise is start light, add a little bit of intensity, weight, every workout, end up with a PR, right? So it's just super basic. You can start at 60%. You can start at 70%. You can start at 80%. You can start with sets of 10. You can start with sets of 5. This depends on a lot of factors, but the basic principle is the same. Start with the doable weight. Go a bit heavier every time, end up with PRs after six, eight, 10, 12 weeks, right? 
Um, keep in mind, this is for strength. For weightlifting, it's slightly different because it's not as linear. But I hope this at least answers your question. How heavy should you start? I always have people start between 60 and 80%, depending on how much time you have and a lot of other factors. I always let people increase weight with 1% to 5% per week. So I hope that answers your question. If not, hit me up with more. Okay. Uh, second person, I don't know who this is, but anyway, hi. Um, how would you describe reversibility in one sentence? All right. Reversibility is actually a very simple concept. Reversibility means getting less fit because you're not doing anything. That's the easiest way. Because if you uh, squat a lot, you get better at squats. You stop squatting, you get worse at squats. That's the, the basic thing. Your body is basically just adapting to whatever you throw at it. You, you squat a lot, your body is like, oh yeah, I need to get stronger. If you just sit on your ass all day, your body's gonna be like, oh yeah, I don't have to do anything. Well, I might as well just get weaker and save my bodily energy for other stuff, right? Okay, next up is Paula. Um, how much difference do you make between building and progressive overload? Because you say in CrossFit you just go hard and heavy, but that's not, uh, but that's more in testing slash competition, and not so much towards training slash building. All right, that's a very good question. Um, what you may need to make sure is that you do not confuse progressive overload and linear overload. Linear overload, which is what I just explained, like two percent a week, that's linear. That's because it's just two percent a week. That is uh, what we call linear progress, linearly overload. Um, that's awesome, but that's just one way of doing it. And that's it hard because in cross, what you see a lot of people do, um, going as hard as you can or going super heavy could be testing, but it could be building a specific thing, and it depends on the workout. A simple example. If I do a, a one rep max in the back squat, that is clearly testing because it is not going to make me very good at uh, doing back squats. Why? Because I get very little practice, because it is very hard to recover from. It is uh, also uh, a very big chance that my technique is going to get worse if I just do one rep maxes. So that's clearly testing. Now, if I do um, I don't know, sets of eight and I say, hey, guys, what you're going to do is sets of eight as heavy as you can with good form. What that means is you're going to give the biggest stimulus you possibly could in that particular workout, but you're going to let form be the judge of how heavy you go. Uh, there is a specific number of reps that you need to do or a specific number of sets. Now, the problem here is um, that same workout is probably not going to come by anytime soon, at least not in CrossFit. So that means all those different workouts need to build up on each other. So today you're doing heavy back squats. On another day, you're doing uh, thrusters, which is very good for leg conditioning, but not necessarily for strength if you for a lot of reps. But if a CrossFit program is good, all these elements build up on each other. In the long term, you still have progressive overload. It is not linear overload, however. Linear overload is just one method of progressive overload. So um, when it comes to testing, um, be very mindful of the intended stimulus. If a workout says, hey, you need to be able to do uh, this workout in eight minutes, and instead you take 20 minutes to finish the workout, it becomes a very different type of workout. That's why, at least at Unscared, we always say, hey guys, this is the goal of the workout. This is how much time you have. That's why we're always so strict on scaling people or, and all that sort of stuff. Because if you have a different intended stimulus, it might become a test or a competition. Um, but yes, you can still go all out and still train and build. There are many training programs working around this, but there is always an idea behind it. The Bulgarians were famous for maxing out twice a day uh, in weightlifting. I don't recommend it, by the way. They used a lot of drugs and their whole life was basically uh, geared towards weightlifting very different from us who have full-time jobs and so on. Um, the West Side Conjugate Style, it's a training program for powerlifters. Basically, you rotate different exercises and you work up to like a three-rep max every time. But all those things fit on each other. It's just not linear, right? So I hope that answers your question. Keep in mind, what is the intended stimulus of my workout? And am I working on progressive overload? Or am I simply working on uh, one way, meaning uh, linear overload? So I hope that answers your question. If not, just hit us up in the chat or the Q&A. Okay, final one for now. Uh, Tim asks, if I did a cycle of 12 to 16 weeks of running, marathon skiing, and I plan on doing a new cycle, how do I depth, uh, adapt for progressive overload? Weight seems easier to progressively overload than cardio. Do I increase running time per session 
training volume by adding days may be a bit specific, but I'd just rather understand the concept in cardio than the weight uh, and comparing cycle one, cycle two, etc. Right. It's a very complicated question. Timo actually basically asks, uh, how, how does this same principle apply to running? Uh, the complicated thing here is that there is a bunch of factors that are at play here. First of all, there is the running volume. So how many miles do you run per week? Uh, then there is how fast are you running? What quality are you trying to train? Are you doing uh, long distance runs to improve your cardio? Are you doing uh, tempo runs to specifically practice running pace uh, in competition? Are you doing intervals? Are you trying to, are you doing, uh, I don't know, 800 meter buildups so you learn how to increase your speed uh, at a specific distance? Are you, no, you get the idea. There's a lot of ways of doing this, but the basic premise is you need to either run more or you need to run faster uh, at the same distance, or you need to do more distance in a specific time frame. There are many ways of doing this. One, I'm not a running coach, so I do have an opinion, but this opinion is probably uh, less interesting than if you were to ask me about strength training. So what I'm going to suggest for now, the only thing I am going to give you, is that if you increase running volume, um, a lot of people measure the total volume per week when it comes to running. So like uh, 10 miles per week or 20 miles per week, so on. If you increase uh, off the top of my head, I think it was 11%, so let's say 10%. If you increase your weekly mileage by more than 10% per week, you have an exponentially uh, bigger increase of risk in uh, getting injuries, right? So the same applies here, small increases, and there are many ways of doing that, but really I would look at that with a running coach if you're serious about running marathons. If you say, I'm a beginner, I want to run 5Ks, yeah, just pick running technique, build basic conditioning, and then you can finish a 5K uh, in a decent time. But if we're talking about a marathon, um, you really need a proper program for this. So I hope that answers your questions. There are many ways of doing it, either increase the volume, increase the speed, or uh, vary the stimulus for specific aspects of your race. All right, more questions, Cecily? No, no, did I just miss something? No, okay, all good, I think. Awesome. I'm going to sh go back to the slides. All right, so we just talked about the SR model. Uh, well, da, 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 there we go. Uh, the, all right, we're going to talk about the systems of the body. This is also very important to understand when it comes to planning your training, also in programming, but also when you do different types of training combined. So that means CrossFit or if you do are a triathlete to the strength training and so on. You have energy systems in the body. We'll go into that later on, but this basically relates to how fast can your body supply um, oxygen to the muscles and um, use carbohydrates to perform and so on. We'll get into that a bit more later on. We're not gonna go too in depth because it can get super complicated super quickly and it's not super relevant for now. You have contractile tissue, the muscles. So most people know that when you train your muscles really hard, um, you deplete them of energy, you damage them, you fatigue them, and so on. The muscles can usually recover between six and 96 hours, depending on how much are you doing, how fast you recover, and so on. Most people know this, it's not super complicated. You train, you rest, they get better, awesome. Then we also have tendons, ligaments, and bones. So this is a bit more complicated because these can also develop minor tears throughout training and they accumulate over time. Let's say you are a power lifter, you do heavy squats a lot, your tendons and ligaments around the knee at some point are gonna get a big beating. The problem is you won't feel that until it's too late. If your muscle is tired, you'll probably feel it. You are slower, you might be a bit weaker, you might be sore. Uh, that is not a big issue because you take a day of rest extra and you're probably fine. For tendons and ligaments and bones, it get more complicated and that is why we have what we call deload weeks or you have uh, rest weeks and so on. We'll also go into that later on, but for now, deload weeks and rest weeks are just weeks where you do less than what you normally do, so your body can catch up in recovering. Um, how fast do your tendons, ligaments, and bones recover? Obviously, this depends on a lot of factors, but just to illustrate, um, if you have a super heavy workout, um, even people who suck at recovering, maybe they sleep bad or they're old and, and, and I don't know, injured and so on, even people with bad recovery can often still recover their muscles within five days, right? And that's like a, a worst case scenario for most people. 
tendons and ligaments, if they are severely damaged, uh, like a minor tear from training and such, um, if you do not manage it properly, it can easily last up to 10 months in worst case scenarios. It does not mean you cannot train for 10 months. It, needs you, it means you need to manage and adjust your training for 10 months, which is very annoying. You can stave this off for the most part by proper programming, taking your rest weeks, taking your deload weeks, slowly building up instead of starting like, hey, this week I'm doing a 10 mile run. Next week I'm doing a 20 mile run. The week after that, a 30 mile, no, that's not how it works. Same with the squat. You don't start with 40 kilos and add 20 kilos a week, right? That's not sustainable. It's either you're not gonna get strong that fast or you're just gonna hurt yourself. So keep this in mind when you think about the systems of the body. It's not just about the muscles and the amount of carbohydrates in your body. It's also about the tendons, ligaments, bones, and also the central nervous system. The central nervous system refers to the brain and the spine, or the nerves in the spine. A lot of people talk about central nervous system fatigue in training. So they do super heavy deadlifts. Maybe they max out their one rep max, and they feel very tired on the day after, and they're like, oh, yeah, my central nervous system is fried. Uh, some re uh, recent research suggests that it's actually not the central nervous system that is fatigued. It is a partially mental. So, of course, you're going to be super tired because you were hyped up for your deadlift and you gave it your all. You're going to be very tired mentally. Um, and peripheral nervous system is also going to be tired. So your peripheral nervous system is all the nerves in your arms and your legs. So maybe when you do a heavy squat, your nerves and your legs are working really hard to make your legs work. They are going to get very tired. But if you have done super heavy squats or deadlifts, you can still do bench presses the day after. Mentally, I don't know. Physically, you're probably fine. Actual fatigue of the central nervous system, which they measured at some point, is usually uh, mostly recovered within 20 to 30 minutes. So that means that you could probably repeat a workout, assuming that the rest of the nervous system and the muscles are not very fatigued. Why is this so important? Because that means that if you've done a one rep max in your deadlift, yes, you can train the day after. Just don't do heavy deadlifts the day after, right? Maybe do bench presses or go for a light run or something that does not tax the same muscles and systems as much, right? Any questions on the systems of the body? Certainly. Not so far. I'm going to give people who may be furiously typing a second. All right. I'm going to go into the next slide in a bit because it relates to this one. Uh, just type in your question uh, if you do have it because we're going to go into that afterwards. These are the energy systems I mentioned uh, in the body. Um, this is how people usually explain it. There's three energy systems. The first one, you can forget about the names on the left. Don't worry too much about the names. Look at the one in the middle. The first one, high speed, strength, power, low endurance. So what is that? That is jumping really high. That is a heavy power clean or a heavy snatch. It's like speed, strength, and power, but you can't do that for very long. If it's your one rep max snatch or your max height vertical jump, you're not going to sustain that for longer than a few seconds. However, it replenishes within a few minutes. There is something in your body called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Uh, you can Google it. Uh, I wouldn't worry about it for now. If you really want to nerd out, um, send me a message and I can give you some links on what it is. Uh, ATP is basically something that makes your muscles function in training. That's for now the easiest way to put it. Um, this replenishes mostly within a few minutes. What does that mean? That means that if you do a really high jump or a really heavy power clean, Within a few minutes, you can probably do that again, right? Uh, if you run a marathon and you're completely dehydrated and tired, uh, you probably cannot run another marathon within a few minutes, right? Otherwise, you probably could have just kept running, which is what ultra marathoners do. Um, when it comes to speed and power, usually replenish within a few minutes. Now, there's two more systems. Uh, some people refer to those energy systems, which is like a classic, uh, how they teach it. It's actually more like a supply system for ATP because all these systems run on ATP. The first one directly, it's like, hey, there's ATP in your body, use it for energy. And the other systems use things like oxygen and sugar to replenish the ATP. Is that super relevant? Um, again, for those that want to nerd out, yes. For those that don't want to go into detail too much, don't worry about it. The second one is high strength and low medium endurance. That's something that lasts for, for example, one minute. So if I do a 100 meter sprint, I'm gonna be in the top section mostly. If I do something that lasts one minute, it's gonna be uh, the second one. And if it's gonna last super long, like an hour, I'm probably gonna be mostly in the third one. Keep in mind that these systems all work together. So you're never 100% in one system. Uh, you're always in some sort of combination, 
but one of these systems is going to be super dominant in specific sports. Why is this important? Because if you are a um, athlete with uh, multimodality training, which means you're a crossfitter or a triathlete combining it with strength training, you need to be very good at all of these energy systems. So you need to train them all. Um, and it also means you need to vary them. You cannot just train only in the third system. You cannot train only in the first one and then expect you to get better at all the other ones. They might have some transfer, just not a lot. Dear Assistant Cecily, has anyone asked a question? Nope, nothing so far. Great. All right, time for another awkward few seconds to give you guys a chance to type out your questions, either in the chat or the Q&A. Otherwise, we will move on to the next slide. Probably put some sort of waiting music on here. Cecily's dancing, but you guys can't see it. All right, next one. Um, yeah, I hate how uh, this shows everything. It kind of takes away the magic. We're going to talk about a few concepts in practice. I took most of these terms from um, Mike Israel from Renaissance Periodization. He works mostly with bodybuilding, powerlifting uh, for the most part. But the concepts he presents are actually universal. He just gave them names that are easily accessible to a lot of people. I'm going to go through these uh, pretty quickly. So if it all sounds like abracadabra, don't worry about it. Because I'm going to go switch to Excel in a bit. I'm going to give you guys a practical example to make it a bit more clear for you guys. Um, what is this about? This is about training volume. So this is the total amount of miles you run, the total amount of sets and reps and exercises you do, the total number of workouts you do, all those things combined. That is the volume that you put on your body in training. The first one is maintenance volume, MV. Your maintenance volume is what you need to... Uh, stave off reversibility. Remember what I said about reversibility? If you do not run, you will get worse at running at some point. Maintenance volume is the absolute minimum you do to make sure you do not regress. You will not get better, but at least you will maintain uh, your level of fitness. That's why we call it maintenance volume. Then there is minimum effective volume. That is the absolute minimum you do to get better at something. So let's say that uh, if I run a 5K every week, I will maintain my fitness. But if I actually want to improve, I need to run at least 10 kilometers. That's a random example, but it's kind of what it boils down to. Then there's the maximum adaptable volume. It's more complicated. This is the most you can do in a week that actually makes you better, right? It's not the same maximum recoverable volume. That's the amount you can do without hurting yourself, without under-recovering. So the minimum you need to do to get better, the maximum you can do that gets you better, and the maximum you can do without killing yourself, basically. The difference between these two is what I usually refer to as the junk volume. Because if I do something more than this, it's not going to make me better. I can recover from it. It's not going to hurt me. I'll be fine. It's just not actually going to make me better. So I'm just wasting my time. Could have spent that time on doing other stuff. Could be, I don't know, watching Netflix or playing video games for all I care. But it's not going to make you any better in terms of training. So that's what we call a junk volume. Um, when it comes to overtraining or under-recovering, this does not refer to overtraining syndrome, which is what some elite athletes have. It's basically when they destroy their body for so long that the whole body starts working against them. They get all sort of uh, depression-like symptoms and all that. That usually doesn't happen because you need to do so much stuff to make that happen. Not really relevant for not elite athletes. Sorry, guys. Um, under-recovery, however, basically means you do more than you re can recover from. Um, if you're lucky, you're just not going to get any better. You're going to hit a plateau. Worst case scenario, you're going to hurt yourself and actually get weaker and less fit, right? For those that find this slightly confusing or complicated, I'm going to give you guys a practical example. Uh, let's see. All right. So what you guys see here, oh, on this one, this one. So we're going to start with bicep curls. Take a look here. It's going to be bicep curls. Of course, it's going to be bicep curls. Um, why? Because it's an easy example. We're going to talk about one muscle group because the principle holds true for the whole body and all the systems, but we're going to keep it very simple just to illustrate the point. Bicep curls. Now, if I do nothing, what you see here, I'm just going to make everything bold that I'm talking about. If you do nothing, let's say zero sets per week, then I'm going to regress, right? Results minus 10%. I am getting weaker. My risk of injury, however, through that moment is 0%. Because if I don't do it, it cannot hurt me, right? 
Now, maintenance volume is the minimum I need to do to get better. Let's say two sets per week. If I do two sets uh, per week, uh, sorry, maintenance volume do not get worse. Two sets per week, my results are 0%. Nothing changes. My risk of injury is 1%. Now, there might be a way to hurt myself. Maybe if I, I don't know, if I go too hard in those sets or I cheat the movement, whatever, I'm probably not going to injure myself with that. It's like 1%. Keep in mind, all these numbers are purely fictional. Just to illustrate the point, this is not what real life looks like. It's about the principle behind it. Now, if I do four sets, that still counts maintenance volume, right? It's not going to get me any better. So it's still 0% results, but I'm doing twice as many sets, and I'm getting twice as much risk of injury. So if I'm trying to maintain, I should probably do two sets instead of four, right? Now, minimum effective volume is six sets. That means six sets, my body is like, whoa, this guy wants bigger biceps. Summer is coming. My body is going to give me bigger biceps. So I get 50% of my maximum results and only 4% risk of injury. Well, 4% risk of injury is not that high. That's pretty awesome. I still get 50% of my results. So 50% is not that much. It's only half of what I could do, but it's super efficient. I'm only doing six sets per week, still getting half of all the possible um, results and super small risk of injury. So is it the most effective? No, only 50%. But it's super efficient because it's only six sets with a low risk of injury. Now, if I do a few more sets, instead of 50%, two additional sets give me 20% more results. Two more sets give me 15% more results. Two more sets give me 10%. So the increase here, if you see, is smaller and smaller. Here's a 50% increase, 20% increase, 15, 10, right? So the more I do, the more effective it gets, the less efficient it gets. Also, my risk of injury with small increments get bigger and bigger. Up to my NAV, my maximum adaptive volume. Sorry, that's maximum, maximum adaptable volume, right? 14 sets per week. That's the maximum I do. I get 100% of my results. 11% risk of injury. Well, I really, really, really want to have big biceps this coming summer. So 11% is certainly acceptable risk of injury. Now, if I add two more sets, because you know, uh, I'm a beginner, I think the more is better. I do two more sets. What happens? My body cannot adapt properly anymore. So I still recover okay-ish, but I'm not gonna get as much results, 91%. The body has trouble, trouble keeping up. Risk of injury also get bigger. Then, other two sets, my results get even worse. I'm not going to get uh, less fit, but I'm still being super inefficient with it because I'm doing more work, more risk of injury, right? More work, more risk of injury, and I'm not even going to get much better out of it. And then comes the worst thing, 20 sets per week. My results are zero. I can't recover properly anymore, so my body does not adapt. I reach a plateau because I'm doing too much. My risk of injury shoots up from 19 to 31%, right? It's a really big increase compared to before. I'm like, oh, I hit a plateau, I'm not getting better. I'm just gonna do two sets more than before. Oh, my body is now like, okay, screw you, Jeremy. Can't do this anymore, 5% worse. I might actually lose muscle mass this way. And my risk of injury goes up even more, pretty big as well. And the last one, so this can go on as much as I want. I could go up to 30 sets per week. I'm gonna get even worse. My risk of injury increases more. So if you look at this in general, uh, what you see here is that uh, most people should be in this area. If you want to be efficient, you should be around here. You know, decent results, low risk of injury, low time investment. Here, 12 sets per week, I have twice as much, uh, twice as much time investment, not twice as much uh, results, but more than twice the injury risk. So it's not very linear. Especially if you cross this threshold, you go beyond here, suddenly you see the injury risk shooting up, the results going slightly down or even negative, and you're putting in even more time and energy. So uh, I can imagine there's a lot of questions about this, so please put in your questions if you have them. I hope I made pretty clear what the principles behind it are. Uh, first of all, more is not better. You need to find your sweet spot. And I'm pretty, pretty sure someone's going to ask, oh, how do we find out where minimum effective <laughs> volume is? Um, so, yeah, that's what I'm going to discuss in a bit.
but any other questions besides how do I find out what my ideal sets are, uh, let us know. It's mostly about the principles behind it, right? So, um, Marike and Van, we will uh, answer the question about how do you know what the numbers are for like MV, MVV, MAV, that sort of stuff in a second. Um, if we don't answer them uh, properly or you feel like you're missing something, let me know in the chat and then I'll uh, tell Jeremy to shut up and uh, answer the actual question. Um, otherwise, um, uh, Marika also asked, uh, no sorry, Han also added that uh, if it's different for each uh, exercise, and uh, obviously it's different for each athlete, but different for each uh, exercise, maybe you can work that into your next answer as well, too. Yeah, I'm going to wait a few seconds for other people to ask their questions. Otherwise, I'm going to go into Marike and Juan's questions here. So, Thijs and Natalie, hi guys. How do you determine the scaling and reps for uh, of this model to your own training scheme in, for example, CrossFit? I love that question. I'm going to go into that in a bit as well. Because for strength training, the questions of how do you know what your MV and so on, uh, and also all those stuff, what, how much are they? Uh, for strength training, it's relatively easy, and you can have a systematic way of finding them out and so on. Uh, for running, actually, the same, although I don't have experience with that, but again, that's very measurable. In CrossFit, it becomes more complex, um, but I'll go into that in a bit as well, because obviously you guys want practical advice and so on, so who am I to withhold it from you? Okay, I see no further questions for now, so let's try and answer uh, your guys' questions and let me know if it's not complete or you're still missing something else, okay? Yeah, I am going to start with uh, Marika's question, are there standards for MAV and MEV and so on, or is it all trial and error? There are guidelines for um, strength training uh, in terms of weightlifting uh, as in general training programs. There are also guidelines for um, building muscle mass. Uh, and to go back to Juan's question, like hey, how do you determine these for each exercise? Uh, when it comes to muscle mass building, which is also sort of a proxy for strength, not entirely, but a bit, um, there are uh, different numbers depending on the muscle group. Some muscles are very resistant to fatigue and some fatigue very easily. Uh, it depends on the person, on genetics as well. But a super simple example, uh, the biceps, you know, the awesome big arm muscles, I hope, are fairly, uh, they fatigue very easily, right? With squats, you can often like, like do an extra set, get extra reps out, but when the biceps are fried, the biceps are fried. Um, for your quads, for example, or your glutes, you can often just push out an extra rep on squats or on deadlifts if you work really hard. Um, but they also take more time to recover. The biceps can often be trained three times a week easily, four times maybe, or some even more than that. Uh, it's very much possible because they recover pretty easily. For bigger muscle groups, you will often find that they're very resistant to fatigue, uh, especially the butt, for example, but it also takes more time to recover from. So how do you know what these numbers are? Well, for um, uh, the simpler sports, like the single modality sports, uh, powerlifting, for example, uh, bodybuilding, you can just write down whatever you do, measure your progress, and as soon as you notice a big dec decrease in speed or performance, you know you are probably doing too much. And if you notice that you're just plateauing, but you're feeling fine and you're not hurting and you just can't add more weight, then you might not be doing enough, right? So uh, there are ways to just log everything in Excel and stuff for that. Um, that brings us to the question from Tyson Natalie, which is a very good question. How do you do this in your own training scheme when you are doing CrossFit? Now, for CrossFit and also for those who do not uh, really want to go through all the tedious work with logging everything, Excel and all that, um, look at a few things. I'm going to go with the example of unscared athletes. So people who train at unscared, they have a set program. There are seven workouts per week. And if you do strength class or weightlifting, you can combine them in some ways. Let's say you are unscared, you train five days a week. You are dependent on the workouts and you need to scale those, right? You need to scale to your level and so on. The biggest thing you can do is again, look at the intended stimulus and auto-regulate. Auto-regulate just means adjusting your workout to how you're feeling on that day. This is something uh, some uh, powerlifters do. For example, they say, hey, I want you to go to 8% uh, effort today. Or at least it should feel like that. 
And some days you're having a bad day and light weights feel like 80% effort. And sometimes you're having an awesome day and you're going for super heavy weights and it still feels like 80%. That's one way of auto-regulation. In CrossFit, you can use scaling to auto-regulate. Uh, you could do less sets or reps because you're feeling very tired. You could do a different exercise for some reason. So uh, basically this principle of making sure you hit your sweet spot is something we usually do with uh, uh, increasing training frequency slowly. So you start with training twice a week. At some point you go to three times a week, then to four or five times. And then at some point you start looking at extra exercise outside of class. You slowly build that up. And other than that, you auto-regulate in class. That's how I usually recommend it for people following group programs in CrossFit. Now, if you do one-on-one -on -one programs, uh, if you have a personalized powerlifting program or running program, then you could basically um, take a look at the program, see how your progress is, see how you're feeling. Do you have like all these weird aches and pains and so on? Write it down. This is one reason why I always tell people, guys, please write down what you do. Please log everything because then I can give you a concrete advice. If I see you doing uh, 40 sets of chest muscles in a week and you say, hey, I'm not recovering properly, I think, I'm not sure what it is, am I getting stronger? I can take a look at your log and I can say, hey, dude, you're doing 40 sets of chest muscles uh, per week. Most people usually go well with 15 to 25 sets per week. So you're probably doing too much. Take out a lot of the volume, see if it gets better. Awesome, there we go. Now I can give you concrete advice. So if you want more concrete advice on this, log what you are doing, discuss it with your private coach and unscared, or your coach if you're not an unscaredian uh, in this seminar right now. It's probably the best thing you can do. So there is no easy answer, uh, although there are some guidelines, especially for uh, weightlifting and for bodybuilding. Other than that, auto-regulation and follow the intended stimulus of the workout. I hope this answers your question. I don't see any other questions or angry people that are uh, not satisfied with the answer. So not satisfied. Yeah, well, I assume some people are not going to be satisfied because they want practical answers. And it is fairly complicated in a lot of cases. So, right. More questions. No, no questions. Just give you guys a few seconds. While I switch you to my other screen. Cecily, my lovely assistant, are there any more questions? Nope. Awesome. We're going to go to the next one. So for those who are like, oh, no, this is all way too complicated and theoretical. I want practical stuff. We're going to go to practical stuff. This one is super important. The time to detraining. So detraining is basically a reversibility thing. You stop squatting, your legs get weaker. You stop running, you get worse running. But all those qualities of fitness that I mentioned earlier have a certain amount of time before they start seriously regressing. So it's not that I have not squatted in two days, I get super weak. No, your strength uh, lingers on for a while. So if you squat twice a week, you recover well, you train often, you're probably going to get stronger. If I squat once every two months, I will probably not get stronger because uh, I squat, I get stronger for a few days, and the reversibility kicks in and get weaker again, right? So how often do you need to train each quality of fitness? This is super important for CrossFitters, uh, especially competitive CrossFitters, but this is also super important for people who combine sports or who have sports that require multiple modalities. So if you're a, a soccer player, you need to be able to sprint, but you also need to be able to have good conditioning, right? Speed, three to five days. Well, that sucks. If you want to be super fast, your speed regresses fairly quickly. That means that if speed is very important for your sport, let's say weightlifting, CrossFit, you need to maintain it at least once or twice a week. Um, kettlebell swings, box jumps, snatches, cleans, all that sort of stuff. If you want to improve or maintain your speed, you probably need to do that once or twice a week. Uh, yeah, at a minimum. Uh, weightlifters usually have some sort of speed work every training day, so they usually train three days at least, up to two times a day. But a powerlifter, for example, doesn't really need speed all that much, so he doesn't need to worry about this. So again, look at your sport, what qualities of fitness do you require, and then you can plan. Power. So power is more about explosiveness. Speed is somewhat less common. Speed is also uh, kind of like skill to some extent. Like I said, throwing a ball. 
doing super light work like a light kettlebell swings. Power refers more to the power cleans and the snatches and all that. Uh, but that also goes down in three to five days. So that means that the CrossFitters and the weightlifters among you, and those who need to be able to do sprints, need to work on their power at least once or twice a week. Could be with sprints. Maybe you're doing it on the field as a soccer player. Great, then you only need to do your power cleans once a week and you're probably good. Aerobic base, there's good news, 20 to 30 days. So that means that for those that want to maintain their aerobic base, you don't have to do a lot of conditioning very often. Aerobic base refers to like the longer duration stuff. Let's say like a, I don't know, a 10K run, for example. Um, does doing a 10K run once every 25 days make you a lot better at running? Uh, probably not. But at least running once so uh, for, uh, let's say, 20 days can at least maintain your aerobic base to some extent. Yes, it will get worse within a week if you don't do enough of it. But before it seriously starts to go down, you have 20 to 30 days. Why is this super important? Because if you are going to the CrossFit Open, for example, five weeks, every week we'll have some sort of uh, conditioning and probably just do some strength in there. But in the Open, there is a very small chance that you're going to be rowing a marathon, right? So you need to maintain an aerobic base, but you can do a lot less of it in that period of time. Maybe once every two weeks, you can have super long workouts that last like, I don't know, maybe like a one and a half hour row or whatever as a competitive CrossFitter. Now the other workouts can be focused more on the things you need on those days. You're going to do more power work, more speed work, uh, more technique work on your handstand walks and all that stuff. You're going to work with that very specific stuff and a bit less of the aerobic base building. Aerobic base building is something you do as a CrossFitter far away from competition. It's different for a marathon runner. A marathon runner needs to have his aerobic base uh, in peak conditioning on competition day because that's you know, what they're doing. A marathon lasts a few hours three to five, or depending on how good you are. Um, so that means that you cannot just neglect your aerobic base for 20 to 30 days. So make sure you place it in context. Keep this in mind when you're doing long-term planning. I know that uh, there's at least two people among you that do triathlons combined with CrossFit. That means for your triathlon, you want to do more of that aerobic base building. But if you're not doing uh, a triathlon for the next seven months, and, but you do have a CrossFit competition day coming up, you could do a bit less aerobic base building for at least um, the next 20 to 30 days. Strength-based, same principle. Um, if you would have me uh, uh, not bench press uh, for a month, I would probably still put up decent numbers compared to my old numbers, but I would probably not do a one rep max. I will definitely get weaker over those weeks, but strength, is not, you don't lose it that fast. I once saw an old guy, he was an ex-weightlifter. The guy was like 60-something years old. The guy was falling apart, uh, had a you know, brain hemorrhage, something like that. Uh, he was a weightlifting coach. And at some point, there was someone who had a 160-kilo bar on the floor, probably from deadlifts or something. It was in the way. So the guy walks up to it, no warming up, nothing. He lifts up the 160 kilos and puts it on a different platform. That's how much strength he had because he was so incredibly strong back in the younger years. Um, that does not mean that you guys need to lift 160 kilos without warm up, just saying. But it does show how much of that strength base, how much of that old man strength can still remain even after years. Muscle mass, 10 to 14 days. Uh, this is a bit complicated. I'm not gonna go into depth very much unless people specifically are interested in that. But the, most of the muscle mass that you can see uh, can deteriorate within a few weeks. But the actual contractile tissue, that's like the, the muscle fibers that actually make you strong, uh, they don't deteriorate very fast. But it, all the water and all the nutrients that are inside your muscles stored, they can go away pretty quickly. So if you're going for the beach body, make sure you keep doing your uh, muscle mass work and so on. But for those that only use it as a proxy for CrossFit or weightlifting, or powerlifting, whatever, they don't have to worry about it that much if you just train all the other stuff. Peak strength, three to 10 days. So if you really want to go for a one rep max or something, um, your peak efficiency doesn't last very long. So you do want to do heavy strength work if you're doing a powerlifting competition. You often want to do heavy strength work, um, depending on how strong you are, any between three to 10 days before the competition. Maybe even further out if you're super strong, uh, you squat 300 kilos or something. But for most people, this is a nice guideline. Why is this important? That means that if you're doing a CrossFit competition 
and there's a big chance of there being a strength uh, aspect. Uh, let's just put all these in perspective. There's going to be a super important CrossFit competition uh, in a bit, three CrossFit workouts in a day. There's a big chance there's going to be uh, something like a one rep max deadlift or a one rep max power clean. Well, you need a lot of peak strength for that, so you want to do some of it at least in the last three to ten days before your competition. Muscle mass, not relevant for CrossFit. You can skip that one. Strength base, 20 to 30 days, great. So you don't have to do like super high volume back squats followed by Bulgarian split squats and Romanian deadlifts. You could probably just get away with only doing some heavy squats and deadlifts once every week or something like that. Aerobic base, well, if you're already 100% sure that the longest workout is going to be 20 minutes, you don't need a super extensive aerobic base. You need some of it. So you still need to do your conditioning, obviously. But you don't have to be running like a 15 mile miler a week before the CrossFit competition, even though you normally might do that. Power and speed, however, you definitely want to train your speed and power in the days before the CrossFit competition, because there's a very big chance there is going to be something with jumping, snatches, cleans, kettlebell swings, uh, push presses, thrusters. A lot of those require some modicum of power. Keep in mind, it is about emphasis and the emphasis. If your sport requires all these qualities or several qualities, never disregard it. Maintain it. Remember what we said about maintenance volume? Uh, for that CrossFit that I mentioned, the example, uh, the maintenance volume for aerobic base and strength base can be pretty low, right? Maybe one heavy set of deadlifts is enough for that. But their speed and power still needs to be emphasized pretty close to competition. If you are a sprinter, you don't have to do pretty much anything for aerobic base close to the competition. But your power needs to be maintained. Uh, your strength base, somewhere in the middle. You probably don't have to do a lot of it. If you understand these things, you could probably plan your weeks around competitions or peak moments or the open and all that. So I hope these things will at least help you give a bit of an idea of how would you uh, prepare yourself for a competition, right? Um, if we go into the injury thing, I want to go back to anyone with questions. Yes. One, I'll start a really nice one. He said five rounds of three reps versus three rounds of five reps. The total of number of reps is the same, but related to MAV, why would I do one over the other? Uh, I like this question a lot because there are a lot of factors to this, and I love hearing myself talk mostly. Um, five sets of three or three sounds of five, three sets of five. Why would you do one or the other? So uh, both of these can be used to build strength. Obviously, just make sure there's the whole progressive overload thing. You're probably going to be fine. However, uh, five sets of three allows you to use heavier weights. That would be very important for powerlifting, for example. But if you do three sets of five, it allows you to use less weight, but it saves a lot of time. So there's a time factor. There's an intensity factor. How heavy can you actually go? Um, the total volume, the total number of reps is the same. However, now I'm going to make it a bit more complicated. How many reps of those were effective? If I do 60% of my one rep max, I could probably do like I don't know, 15, 20 reps of that. If I do uh, 100 sets of one repetition uh, with a lot of rest in between, it's going to take me a lot of time. It's not going to stimulate me a lot because, you know, it's not super heavy. I'm not actually doing a lot. But if I do um, the same number of reps, five sets of 20, suddenly it's going to get very hard. and then all of a sudden, uh, my body gets a very big stimulus. So uh, the reason why I'm mentioning MAV uh, in terms of sets is to make it a bit easier to understand. But if you really want to go in depth, and I'm pretty sure that 99% of you guys doesn't have to do this, if you go super in depth, you have to look at the effective reps. How many of the reps were actually stimulating you to get stronger and fitter and so on? Um, if you go all out, if you do MRAPs or you train to failure, you're 100% sure that you're doing effective reps. If you're just half-assing it, you're probably not doing effective reps. The hard part about this is you never really know for sure. Uh, one guideline in strength training is if you start slowing down, you're probably doing effective reps for the purpose of strength. For the purpose of speed, you just want to move really quickly. Um, there are other factors as well. Uh, if you set five, you get fatigued, you will get slower. So sets of five is not as good for uh, getting fast, like doing uh, squats. Uh, you probably want to do sets of three at a lower weight so you can develop more power. So there's tons of considerations here. But as a rough guideline, for most of you guys, don't worry about it. I hope that answers your questions satisfactorily. If not, 
uh, bother your private coach about it because they give you more concrete advice on how many sets and reps to do. Thank you, Juan. I'm really happy that it does not disappoint you. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Any more questions right now? No, nothing so far. No other questions. Oh, I've got one. Oh boy. Lorenz asks. Yeah. Uh, are the like average slash normal percentages of improvement, whether that is strength slash endurance, whatever, per a certain amount of time? So when you're analyzing how many sets you do versus your improvement, yeah. you know you're improving enough or not, or it could be better. Ah, um, so the question was, uh, there are guidelines for how much you should improve. So I mentioned earlier, one to 5% per week. And the question was, is it related to time? Because I could also say 2% uh, per workout or 2% per day or so much percent per month. Um, there are some guidelines uh, on this, but it depends obviously on a lot of factors. For example, when I write a training cycle for people, like when I coach weightlifters or powerlifters, I usually want them to improve their one rep max by two to 5% every eight to 12 weeks. Uh, and again, depending on a lot of factors, a beginner can get strong very quickly and super advanced people need to work super hard uh, not to just uh, get worse. For super advanced people, their minimum effective volume is super high um, and the maintenance volume is also higher. But the problem is what happens if your minimum effective volume, so the minimum you need to do, is uh, 25 sets per week to get stronger, but you cannot recover from more than 20 sets. Yeah, then you've reached your genetic potential. So getting back to your question, um, is it related to time or not? It relates to how well you can recover. If you can recover from doing squats three times a week, you recover well, then you can certainly add 2% every single workout. If you do not recover very fast, or because, maybe because you, uh, I don't know, you have very bad sleep quality or your, your diet is horrible or you're super stressed out, but also is worse for your recovery. If you have all those issues, then at some point you have to uh, take a look at maybe you need to train once a week um, and then spread that 2% out over a whole week. So for most people, I find 1% to 5% per week is nice, but if you recover quickly, especially if you're a beginner, uh, you can certainly do something three times a week and add one to five percent every single time. You could probably maintain that for quite a while, especially if you uh, start light. But as a general rule of thumb, the one to five percent per week um, works for a lot of people. And for you specifically, I know you're not a beginner, one to five percent per week for you would be good. So if you squat twice a week, I would add two percent per workout and you would probably have a very nice guideline. This is the reason why in strength class, I always tell people, hey guys, uh, these two months, we're doing powerlifting theme. Start light, 60%. You want to build up to 100% over the course of two months. Plan accordingly, right? So keep that in mind, 1% to 5% per week. But adjust if you recover very well or, and or are a beginner, right? Advanced people need to make smaller steps. And um, for me, for example, at some point uh, when I wanted to increase my squat, I would be super happy if I got like 5 to 10 kilos in a year. But when I began... I could add five to 10 kilos in a month and I would be completely fine, right? So your progress will slow down at some point. It's not how uh, your level as an athlete, it's not like the higher your level as an athlete, the, uh, the higher uh, the stimulus needs to be and the slower you recover, it's a, it's a factor. But it's more about how close are you to your genetic potential? I mean, you can uh, be super weak, sorry guys, you can be super weak and still be super close to your genetic potential. You can also be super strong and still not be at your genetic potential. So yeah, long story. I hope that's your question. Okay, no further questions so far. Awesome. Let's just go further into the next one. Injuries. Why do they happen? So this is a very complicated question uh, because there are a lot of factors to injuries. There are basically three factors here. One is physiology. This is very simple. If I cut off my hand, it will probably hurt. Um, probably. If um, I hold my hand close to the fire, I will hurt myself before I have burnt myself. That is not physiology. Well, it is partially, but it's also neurology. My body warns me that there is something wrong. Um, this means that certain other factors, something like having a bad night of sleep, being super stressed, can also make you more susceptible to pain. 
extreme example that you see with some people, people who suffer from clinical depression, sometimes get things like stomach aches, even though there's physically nothing wrong. It is the mind, the brain, the nerves, basically, the neurology, thinking that something is wrong and giving you a, sort of a pain sensation. Now, uh, this is a bit complicated. Maybe some of you guys have had an injury. You went to the physical therapist or you even got like an MRI or something. They said, well, there's nothing wrong. Everything looks fine. That means that physically, there's not necessarily anything wrong. There's no damage. Still, there can be pain uh, or an injury. So that means it's probably neurological or there could be a psychological component. So we have three, neurological, physiological, psychological. And psychological, for example, could be fear of pain. If you are afraid of pain, you will move differently. You will be more susceptible to pain because you're constantly thinking about it, right? So those three things intertwine. So why do injuries happen? Well, it's actually a list of things. Those three things are all factors. Uh, but in practice, to stick with the subject of training planning seminar, high sudden increases in volume. So if I go from a 5K run in one week to five 5K runs in the next week, I exponentially increase my uh, risk of injury so sudden increase that's why we say start simple twice a week and as you become a more experienced athlete you go to three times a week four times a week five times a week uh, depends on you of course slowly build up that's one two is proper technique proper technique is not a guarantee that you will not hurt yourself but you will certainly decrease the risk for the simple reason that if you have very bad technique and you hit yourself in the face with the barbell it hurts i can say from experience so yeah, fix your technique. That certainly helps to some extent. Slowly build up the volume and manage your fatigue. What does that mean? You train hard, you need to rest a lot. You train easy, you don't need to rest a lot. If you are someone who trains six times a week or even more often and you train heavy, you need to recover properly, sleep well, eat well, manage your stress, right? Adjust intensity, auto-regulation, whatever. If you're someone who trains two times a week recreatively and you feel like, hey, I'm 20 years old, I recover fine, I'm just training for fun, I'm not super competitive, I don't train super heavy. You don't need rest weeks. I mean, you're not hitting your body really hard. You're just trying to stay healthy. Hey, awesome, good for you. It's very different. So again, look at it in context. Um, Deload and rest weeks, what are they and how do they work? A rest week is just not doing anything. It's just a week where you go on vacation and don't train at all. Uh, this allows your body to recover completely, but if you, this lasts for too long, you will also detrain. There will be reversibility. So rest weeks are fine for the recreationally active people, but for those who are competitive, don't have rest weeks, have deload weeks. Deload weeks are weeks where you do less or train lighter so that your body can recover better, but you don't get worse because you're still training at maintenance volume. That's the basic principle. So if you do CrossFit five times a week, maybe in a deload week, you're only going to do CrossFit three times a week, and you're going to have one easy swim and a brisk walk or two other days. You automatically lower the intensity and the volume in that week, and you're absolutely not going to get worse just because you do that. But you might be able to stave off injuries, which is kind of the point. Um, how often do you need deload weeks? Uh, that depends on the person, obviously. But I usually say anywhere between 4 and 12 weeks. 4 weeks is for people who have a monotonous sport, like powerlifting or running. Um, especially powerlifting because it's such a heavy load, but also long-distance runners although they usually incorporate that in their programs already. Uh, but anyone doing heavy strength training uh, um, and nothing else who is like older than 50 and already has pre-existing injuries, they should go probably go for like four weeks or so. On the other spectrum, there's people who are like 20 years old, are super fit, recover fine, don't have big stressors in their life, nutrition is on point and so on. They can easily go with a deload week every 12th week or so, and they'll probably be fine. There are many ways to do deloading weeks. Uh, like take out one third of the volume, train twice less than you normally do, uh, lower the intensity, or, you know, there's many ways of doing this and really, really check this with your own coach on what is uh, a good idea for your first situation. But really do deload weeks before you get hurt, not after. Because if you do a deload week and you feel like, whoa, that was not necessary, you will feel awesome in the week after and you will be able to train super hard in the week after because you're fully recovered. If you wait until you get hurt, who's to say that a deload week is enough? Maybe you'll have to work around your injury for five weeks afterwards. That's going to suck if you're a competitor. So plan your deload weeks accordingly. Rest weeks are really for recreational athletes who are not too worried about performance. Any questions on deload weeks and rest weeks and injuries?
awkward silence. It's not awkward. <laughs> Just trying to be considerate of you guys, you know? Sean Paul gives us a compliment. Nice explaining. Ah, thank you. The physical therapist gave us a nice expl uh, gave us a compliment, saying it was a nice explanation. I forgot you were here. If I had known you were here, I would have been super nervous about answering uh, injuries. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to be super honest about this, but thank you. Ha 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 ha! Was the reaction? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can laugh all you want. All hey, right. Nothing else, I don't think. No questions. Awesome. We're nearing the end. Um, so after this, we have a case study where we are working in the live seminar. We're going to do that one. I'm still going to run you guys through it quickly. Um, so what we see here is Anna. It's our own Anna uh, Max from uh, Inscared. I used her as a case study. I had her permission. I made a uh, fictional Anna out of her. Three months of preparation for the Open, and I wanted people to approach it like a video game. So you have 100 points of recovery every week. You have to divide that over the different sports she does with uh, in the back of your head that she wants to do all these sports, but the open is her priority. Now, um, don't worry too much about the points. That is, again, fictional numbers just to illustrate the point. But I want you guys to go all the way down here. Work, study, other stressors, 5 to 30 points. Highly variable. Why? Because your body, especially the neurological part, is heavily influenced by all the stresses you have in daily life. So if you say, well, I want to train more, that means you need to lower the other stressors because otherwise your body and your head cannot cope with it. How do you do that? Well, manage your stress. Stress is unavoidable. I mean, you're always going to have some sort of work stress, even if you feel good about it. I mean, sometimes I have to do a lot of stuff for work. I enjoy doing it. I'm still placing strain on my body and my mind. It's not a bad thing. It's just something you have to cope with. You have to learn to deal with it. If you are so stressed from work that you cannot sleep properly, then you have to work on your stress management because if your sleep sucks, if your diet sucks, if your stress management sucks, um, if your general attitude sucks, you are probably not going to recover as well. So there's a lot of stuff you can do uh, about it. I'm going to write some blog posts for daily vitamins. So uh, outside people from not unscared, subscribe for the daily vitamins, uh, the, um, the daily unscared newsletter that we have during the Corona misery. Um, but for the unscared uh, people, Ask your private coach because they are equipped to give you, at the very least, some basic advice on nutrition, sleep quality, and so on. All right. Uh, so take that into account. Uh, why is this so important for training planning? Well, let's say that you're a student and you have exams coming up. During the exams, you could take an easy week of training so that you could focus more on exams. You have more time for that. And at the same time, uh, you can recover better from your workouts. So that means a win-win situation for both your uh, exams and your training, right? Instead of being uh, in a situation where, oh no, exams are coming up, I need to study super hard in the week before that, but I also need to train a lot before that. Oh no, now I'm stressed because of the whole planning thing. And because you're stressed, you're gonna recover even worse. And all that thing, uh, all those things, they just stack up and you're gonna have two super shitty weeks. You're gonna mess up your workouts, you're gonna under-recover, maybe even mess up your exams. But if you realize that, hey, so I have to um, take a deload week during the week before the exams so that I have more time to study and I don't have to worry too much about it. And suddenly the whole situation is flipped upside down and everything becomes a lot more manageable. One, your quality of life improves. Two, your exams will probably go a lot better. Three, you uh, will probably perform better and recover better, right? So keep this one in mind. This is really, really important. We all talk about training and nutrition but the importance of sleep and stress management is vastly understated. All right, last one, a few tips for the case study, but also tips for when you are um, planning for yourself. Again, look at emphasis, the emphasis of the training qualities, the fitness qualities. Make sure every quality that you need is at least maintained. Never neglect it, only emphasize or de-emphasize, and avoid overlap in training a quality. If a thruster uh, with low weight and they wall ball are same all of the same movement pattern do you really need to do both of them a lot to improve that pattern or could you do one of them and do the other one in a different week just so you can get low the movement right uh, i don't know depends on your personal situation obviously but you could have used that same time that you're spending on thrusters and wall balls you could have just done one of them and then use the rest of the time to improve your handstand which is also a weak spot so look for transfer uh, from one movement to another when you're uh, planning. A great example that I always give, sometimes I tell people, hey, 
do weightlifting classes beside CrossFit because you need to improve that. I will always tell them, you're already doing weightlifting in weightlifting class. Don't do weightlifting workouts in CrossFit because then all you're doing is weightlifting. Do weightlifting in weightlifting class and pick the CrossFit workout where you do rope climbs, double unders, handstand walks, uh, all that sort of stuff. Uh, so you avoid the overlap and you're way more efficient in using your time. So there's another practical thing. Avoid the overlap in training the quality uh, and look for transfer. In the assignment, we could ignore the fun factor. I'm going to give you guys the opposite advice. Do not ignore the fun factor. There is no reason to be super performance-based. Oh, yeah, I want to get a 100-kilo snatch, whatever, and then not have fun and drop off the bandwagon in two months. Make it sustainable, right? Stay injury-free, have fun, and make sure that you can actually exercise for life instead of for that one competition in two months, right? Say this from old grumpy strength coach who had way too many injuries because he was so focused on competition and now is just fat and can't really do a lot, right? Cool. Overall questions. We've reached the end of the seminar. And what I um, am going to do now is I'm going to give you guys an opportunity to ask uh, more questions. I'm going to hang out here for a few more minutes. You basically have until 9 p.m. if people have like lots of questions. But if you guys want to overthink, if you have more questions, I'm going to be here at least for a few minutes waiting for the first questions to come in. Uh, for those training at Unscared, don't be afraid to actually uh, send a message to your private coach. You should know uh, through the newsletter that you guys get extra private coaching sessions. You can do those through Skype uh, or, or by phone if necessary. If you have training material at home, you can ask the coach if they have a few extra exercises that you can do for your specific weak point. So, um, yeah, it's probably going to be Bulgarian split squats. I'm not going to lie to you guys. Um, but, yeah. Let us know if you need any help with any of the aforementioned subjects. Keep an eye on the blog posts. We will be doing uh, daily uh, blog posts for um, daily vitamins. Actually, it's every other day. And some of them are going to touch on the same subject. So practical advice on how to sleep better and so on. I have a question from Juan. How do we go back to training after all this? Exclamation mark. Um, yeah, we don't. We should probably just you know, accept the coming apocalypse and, and so now, um, how do we go back to training after all this? First of all, keep moving. Maintenance volume for a lot of people is very low. That means that if you keep moving, do your workouts every day, if you can, you know, you're, you're getting the workouts with the videos and the email, do your workouts. You can really maintain a lot of your fitness more than people think. Like I said, uh, I've had a lot of periods of time where I trained less because of injury and so on. I never really got that much weaker. I didn't get stronger but I never got that much weaker either because I just kept moving most of the time. So keep moving. Then when you actually go back to regular training, especially the heavy intense training, simply um, set a new baseline. Don't worry too much about your old rep max. Set a new baseline. That means going for auto-regulation. Hey guys, today is heavy sets of five. Don't go for a five rep max. Work to the heaviest set of five that you can manage. It's going to be lighter than what you could do two months ago. That's fine. Your strength will come back. Reattaining your fitness goes faster and easier than building fitness from scratch. All right, so I hope that answers your question, Juan. Uh, ah, Marika, thank you uh, for the compliment. Glad to hear it was fun and you learned some new stuff. And thank you, Juan. Also, happy that you got your question answered. Great, more questions. So, Alan Meek asks, uh, do you recommend to do the home workouts every day? Um, that depends on a lot of factors. The home workouts that we currently do at Unscared are not as intense as most of the workouts that we normally do for various reasons. So there are no heavy weights. So the axial loading, uh, not actual, but axial. So like there's a weight on top of you, like a, a back squat or there's a weight in your hands, like a deadlift. That usually causes a lot of fatigue. You don't have that. Um, the workouts are not super high volume. So the workouts we do now, the way uh, I see it, is actually great for health because the impact is fairly low, but you still have varied movements and you're still pushing yourself. So um, I would say that you can do them more often than the normal workouts. Can you do them every day? I don't know. I think so. A lot of you guys could probably do them every day. Um, 
depending on a bunch of factors. So if you are injury free, you know, that's a, an important factor. But they're not so intense that you have to be like, oh, I can only do twice, uh, twice a week. I think most of you guys that I see um, scrolling through the list of attendees, I think all the people I see here, if you do not look at things like, um, you know, the uh, injuries and all that, I think you could probably do them every day. Um, but again, make sure you're having fun. If you're not having fun, if you're doing it because you feel like you have to, it's better to do it three times a week, dedicated until you can back, go back to training it unscared than doing it seven days a week and then getting bored after one week and not doing it anymore. But physically speaking, yeah, man. Also, Tice and Samuel and Natalie say thanks. Uh, we're happy to help, guys. Oh, Samuel, you're not an Unscared member. If you have questions in hindsight and you're not following the Unscared um, uh, newsletter, uh, you can send me a message on Instagram. I'll be glad to help you out. Uh, so, Paula, uh, you asked if you can receive the seminar notes of video. Um, if you are following the vitamins, we will be, uh, we recorded this session. Uh, so, uh, we will be adding it to the vitamins uh, sometime this week. We're going to see if we can do it on Friday. No guarantees, but probably on Friday. And you can take screenshots of everything. Uh, but if you send me an email, I mean, I could, I could send you an Excel file. I just made that one in like 10 minutes. It's certainly not an issue. Um, so, yeah, you'll be getting the whole video uh, at some point. Uh, yeah, the vitamins are through unscared. If you need a link, uh, either send me a message or Jeremy and we'll uh, send you the link so you can subscribe to that. Um, and uh, otherwise, uh, we can uh, uh, help you out by sending uh, something else. Uh, so if you need anything more, let us know. Hey, I'm back. Whoa. I'm sure you guys are waiting for this. All right, more questions. Okay, Enrico. This better be smart, bro. Since the volume slash fatigue is lower than what we normally are used to, even though we train daily now, should we adjust uh, our nutrition? Um, that is a very good question. Should you adjust your nutrition? Well, it depends. Yeah, I know, guys, boring answer, but it's the truth. It depends on a lot of factors. Um, I would say do not necessarily adjust it too much. However, you will probably burn less calories than you normally do. Not so much because of the workout, because you do not burn that many calories in one hour of working out. The different, let's say that you normally burn 300 calories at most in a heavy workout, and you need to work pretty hard in an hour to get 300 calories, depending on the workout. Um, of course, if you're like a, a, I don't know, a Tour de France uh, cyclist, then you're gonna be burning like four times as much in an hour. But for a lot of workouts, the way we have it, especially strength workouts, you're not burning that much. Let's say 300 calories, for example, and now you're only burning 200 calories with the workout you're doing right now. Is that going to make a huge difference? No. 100 calories is like one, uh, sorry, one tablespoon of oil. That is one, a little more than one slice of bread with nothing on it. So I would not worry too much about those details. However, if you are inside a lot, you go less outside, that means that you have... Um, several hundred calories per week of not training, several hundred calories per week of not riding your bike to work, several hundred calories per week of not going out to do your groceries and visit friends, then it becomes an issue. So if the rest of your daily life is not very different from normally, uh, I wouldn't worry about it. But if you are sitting on your ass all day uh, because of the whole quarantine thing and you're doing lighter workouts, yeah, then you might want to adjust your calories down a bit uh, if you're really worried about, you know, not having your six packs, six pack in a few months from now. Okay. Um, Paula, I'm glad you found the vitamins. Um, any other questions, guys? I see nothing in the chat. Q and A. Nope. Awesome, guys. All right. Um, I'm going to stay here for a minute or so just for people who have new questions and so on. Um, for those that intend to leave in a bit, first of all, thank you for sitting it out the whole uh, one and a half hour or so. Um, reminder, if you're a trainee and scared, ask your private coach for more in detailed um, advice on the whole subject if necessary. If you have questions that are specific to the seminar, you can always email me at jeremy at unscaredcrossfit.com. Uh, hopefully Friday we will release the video of this seminar. Uh, again, no guarantees. Uh, we'll have to take a look at all the other stuff we're putting in the daily vitamins. Uh, and again, thank you guys. Uh, keep in mind, spoilers, next week 
and most likely two weeks after that, again, no guarantees, we are doing the nutrition course that we have in a shorter, simpler version. So uh, we have a nutrition course uh, that is normally like three afternoons, uh, three and a half hours, assignments and all that. We're going to do a simpler, more theoretical version of it, shorter uh, for you guys. It will most likely be the coming free Mondays from seven to nine. You'll find more information in Daily Vitamins. Uh, if you have any questions about that, again, hit me up at jeremy at unscaredcrossfit.com. Right? No more questions? All right, I'm going to kick all of you guys out. Again, thanks for watching. Hopefully see you on the next few seminars. And wash your hands. Bye, guys.